EBS Audio. From the Evening Standard in London, I'm Rochelle Travers and this is The Leader. Pride Month is officially here. Taking over the calendars every June, there are loads of events, festivals, exhibitions and more, all celebrating the LGBTQ plus community. London is considered one of the best places in the world for Pride and here to explain why, plus give you her top picks of things to see and do, is Elle Hunt, culture writer for the Evening Standard. The history of Pride dates all the way back to 1970. The first ever Pride march took place in New York City that same year and it was held to mark one year since the Stonewall riots. So yeah, the Stonewall Inn is a historic gay bar on Christopher Street in New York's Greenwich Village. And back in the late 60s, kind of in the years running up to the Stonewall riots, police raids and alcohol seizures were increasingly common there. And people who drank and partied in the venue would often be arrested for things like disorderly behaviour and wearing drag, which was um, criminalised at the time in New York. And one night, um, the punters decided that they had had enough and a huge protest broke out on the streets outside in the midst of a police raid that was happening. Um, And after the uprising, a number of new activist groups like the Gay Liberation Front began to appear And it all seemed to really kind of galvanise the queer community to fight back um, and campaign for equality. So, yeah, the following year, a bunch of these activist groups that kind of sprung up in the aftermath of the Stonewall riots organised Christopher Street Liberation Day, which is now remembered as the very first Pride March. Mm -hmm. And of course, now Pride is kind of this global event. Um, The first march took place in London in 1972 and similar parades and festivals now take place all around the world to celebrate the LGBTQ plus community. Pride Month itself runs through June every year and then a whole bunch of kind of parades and celebrations take place around that sort of throughout the summer. So in August you'll have Brighton Pride um, and then London's biggest Pride Parade typically takes place on the nearest Saturday to the anniversary of the Stonewall Riots. Um, So this year it's on July the 1st. London is considered one of the best places in the world for Pride. Why is that? I would say probably because London is one of the biggest cities in the world and probably one of the best cities in the world in terms of the diversity of its kind of queer scene. It knows how to put a party on. (laughs) You've been looking at some of the key LGBTQ plus cultural events and exhibitions happening over the month. Just walk us through some of the standout ones. Sure. So for me, one of my standouts is definitely we slash us. Um, at Space Station 65 in Kennington. So that's a exhibition which celebrates working class butchers and studs with a series of portraits by the photographer Roman Manfredi. There's not much time left to catch it because it closes on June 3rd, but if you can squeeze it in, it's definitely worth your time. And otherwise, you know, even if even if you don't manage to get down this weekend, Space Station 65 is just generally a really fantastic gallery and it's kind of quietly becoming a real hot spot in London for really fascinating exhibitions which do tend to lean towards kind of exploring different facets of the LGBTQ plus community. So another another kind of thing that's happening to celebrate Pride Month that we've spotlighted is a kind of treasure trail that's been organised around the British Museum which kind of takes anyone who follows it on a little tour of all these sort of artefacts that have interesting connections to different aspects of queer history basically so you know there's sections on the poet Sappho who was kind of famous for her sort of lesbian poems in ancient Greece you know there's a wine cup which is covered in different scenes of sort of male lovers which was actually banned from being displayed in museums in the 20th century and has now kind of been taken out of hiding and and put to the forefront the globe theater is also doing sort of guided tours to explore kind of what queerness would have looked like in shakespeare's day which feels like a really interesting um kind of route to go down and obviously shakespeare's plays have a lot of kind of sort of gender fluidity in them plays like Twelfth Night um, and that's also going to be kind of explored in the guided tour as well so I think that could be a really interesting way of you know looking at a really iconic London venue for theatre through slightly different lens. Another really cool event to check out would be Tate Britain's Queer and Now which is a big takeover on June 10th sort of fresh from its shiny new rehang so they'll be showcasing kind of LGBTQ history and culture with a a big takeover that kind of draws on the queer themes in their current exhibitions. 
So they've currently got two exhibitions with the installation artist Isaac Julian and then the radical Rossetti generation. And sort of alongside that, the gallery will host three performances, pop-up talks, workshops, family events, DJs, artist readings, all sorts of different things. And that's all day on June the 10th. It's also a big time for music concerts and festivals. What are some of the big ones happening during Pride Month? So the biggest of all would probably have to be the Mighty Hoopla, which takes place this weekend on June 3rd and June 4th in Brockwell Park. It's not an LGBTQ plus festival or a Pride event per se. You know, anyone and everyone can head on down. But I would say that it still kind of feels like a celebration of queer culture. The organisers who used to run the incredible drag night, Sink the Pink, have really spent a lot of time and care on creating this really fun, inclusive vibe at the festival. And along with kind of heaps of pop acts, old and new, sort of from Sophie Ellis Baxter to Years and Years, you'll find there's loads of incredible drag, cabaret, comedy, sing-alongs, often hosted by these really talented queer performers. And then you've also got Pride in London, which is kind of London's main Pride event. Um, And they host a couple of stages with music and performance every single year. Um, I believe that the lineup for this year's event will be announced soon, but that's definitely also something to keep an eye out for when it does land. Let's go to the ads. Stay there to hear from the Evening Standard's Jonathan Cannangoni on why the Naughties is having a renaissance. Why not hit rate and follow in the meantime? The Naughties, a time of flip phones, teen angst TV dramas, questionable fashion choices and unforgettable pop bands. Well, it looks like they're all making a comeback. The era has been dubbed the new 80s as many of its most memorable attributes are now re-entering pop culture once again. Jonathan Canangoni, music journalist at the Evening Standard, has been looking into the reason behind the great Naughties revival. We can see the revival pretty much in almost all aspects of culture. I mean, say for example, with TV, you know, we've got reboots of Naughty's classics coming left, right and centre. Gossip Girl is back, Sex and the City's done their reboot. There's, there's loads of different examples of TV shows that people loved back in the Naughty's coming back. And that translates also with things like fashion, for example. You'll, you'll notice, I'm sure, especially with Instagram and stuff like that, a lot of the fashion trends that have been going on at the moment have been kind of very naughty centric. You know, we've got those kind of butterfly designs that everyone used to wear back in the day. Loads of bejazzled clothing, low rise jeans and stuff like that coming back, double denim, loads of that kind of iconic naughty fashion trends. Loads of those are starting to come back too. And obviously we can see this in music a lot. You know, we've got S Club 7 doing their kind of reunion tour We had Steps doing the same thing. Busted is releasing an album this year. So is McFly. There's so many examples of these artists that were kind of synonymous with that time making a comeback. What do you think has caused this resurgence of the era? So in terms of the reasons, I mean, for me and uh, the people that I spoke to in the piece, for example, Carolyn Owlett from the 411 and also Sophie Ellis Baxter, they all share this same view that, you know, as times at the moment are getting kind of more unprecedented, there seems to be some sort of association with the noughties being quite a settled time for a lot of us who are now kind of the working generation. Back then, you know, we were we were kids, so we were kind of innocent there's a lot of that kind of fun playful feel about the noughties and I feel like people just want to go back to that really you know with all the stuff that's going on at the moment it's kind of like a simpler time do you know what I mean and it's a very playful time as well people were just having fun with stuff people were just a bit more kind of a bit less judgy I would say I think there's a lot more of that now especially in culture people are very guarded and I feel like the noughties was definitely not like that. How much are hugely popular social media accounts such as Love of Huns influencing this resurgence, do you think? Yes, I think Love of Huns and accounts like that, I think there's also an account called Pop Culture 2000. They play a big part in it. And the engagement that these accounts get on social media kind of reflects the popularity of the noughties with the current generation at the moment. Obviously, Love of Huns really reflects that that kind of UK culture that was going on at the time. They obviously love to post about like Girls Aloud and Victoria Beckham in her posh bob phase, you know, all those kind of really 
iconic moments in pop culture which people back then probably thought was slightly lowbrow they're just doing so well like we just look back at them and we're like oh my god do you know what I mean like you just there's some sort of as I say fun aspects about looking back at all of those times and I think people relate to them quite a lot and I think you know with the growth of social social media and a lot of the stuff that we might have even missed back then resurfacing on accounts like love of puns I think it's only going to add to that kind of noughties nostalgia feel that's growing at the moment. There was also a bit of a dark side to the noughties too though wasn't there like the treatment of Britney Spears back then do you think people are maybe forgetting those more problematic parts of the decade? This is a tricky one because obviously yes the noughties is really really synonymous with that kind of um, press intrusion and kind of tabloid culture aspect of, of the media and we saw that with Britney Spears but we've also seen it with other figures like Lindsay Lohan for example who was absolutely hounded by the tabloids back then. I would like to feel as though because we've moved on as um, as society uh, and especially in the media we've learned a lot from the mistakes that happened back then. I'd like to feel like that might be the reason why those types of aspects are not really kind of looked at too much in terms of this this building kind of nostalgic factor. But at the same time, obviously, you know, with some of these social media accounts, some of them are looking back at those times with a bit of affection. I mean, you know, Lindsay Lohan's mugshots have become iconic now, even though obviously at the time it was probably really distressing for her and kind of showed those aspects of the media and press intrusion that we didn't like. I feel like now, hopefully, because we've... Um, adapted as a society and we're not kind of repeating those types of behaviors i feel as though that's probably the reason why people are looking at the naughty slightly more affectionately and, and and leaving that kind of negative aspect behind but obviously there were big lessons um that were to be learned from that period um and obviously that part is is a part that you can't ignore do you see this naughty's trend continuing for the foreseeable future yes definitely i mean as, as we say, you know, we uh, we as as people, I feel like we've always had that kind of, um, we've always had that sense of wanting to look back at a time that we perceive was probably more, um, more settled, a, a time that was better, more fun. You know, we used to do that with the 80s. You know, the 80s was that period for ages where people were like, oh my God, I wish I was born in the 80s. It was so fun, this and that. I feel like that's what we're getting with the noughties now. Um, obviously for me it's great because I was actually born at that time so I <laughs> I was able to experience it all and you know I you know when I look back I can I just think of good times really and I think that probably resonates with a lot of people one thing that I am um, that I spoke about when I was speaking to some of the people who were in the piece was things like relating to the fact that obviously because when we were kids we couldn't really we didn't have our own disposable income and stuff we couldn't really live out the noughties the way that we can now so all these artists that are doing their revivals and stuff like that for us it's like we actually get to afford to go to these shows now we can go and see s club seven and stuff which we probably didn't do back then because you know it was mum and dad who had to decide that <laughs> you can read more about pride month and the great noughties revival on our website standard.co.uk and that's it from this episode of the leader this podcast is back on monday at 4 p.m <laughs>